Well, it's terrific to be here on Night of Worship. Thank you for joining us online. Um, these are very special nights in the life of Shoreline Church. The first Wednesday night of each month, we uh, speak and we do what we can to just go deeper into in worshiping the Lord, praying, hearing the word, uh, being a community together, and just turning our hearts over to God. It's just a beautiful thing. And this year we have a unique theme. In the nights of worship, what we're doing is we're taking a biblical figure who's known to be a person of great inspiration to others that God called, that, that, that works in, in the kingdom with great power to great effect. So a biblical figure, then we're, then we're putting them alongside of a more modern contemporary figure who also is called by the Lord, inspires us, and does ministry with great power for the kingdom. I have the honor tonight of sharing with you from the life of Isaiah the Old Testament and the life of someone more modern and known to Shoreline, Nabil Qureshi. Uh, both people called by, Lord, by the Lord um, to do changes in their life, follow him, and do powerful things in ministry for his kingdom and his glory. So let's start tonight with Isaiah. So Isaiah was originally from an aristocratic family. Uh, he had great means, his family did, and he was sent to the best schools. It turns out that Isaiah learned the finest Hebrew you can learn in his time. And so he gets a job at the palace, and he works with for and with King Uzziah, and he's a scribe. And at that time, 5 to 15% of the people could read were literate. Everyone heard the Word of God, but not everybody could read the Word of God. So he has this really cool job. You know, he has a good income. He has a position of prestige. Uh, he's admired. It's a job a lot of people would love to have. He has a, apparently a great mind for learning and a great mind for articulating what he's learned. And he's cruising. He's cruising along. He's doing really, really well in life. And then God had other plans. God had other plans for Isaiah. And we read about those plans. We get a taste of this in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. This is a well-known verse. Let me share it with you. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. And the Lord said, Go. You see, you'll also read in that chapter 6, that Isaiah, when he had this vision, this call from the Lord, he didn't feel worthy at all, and he's kind of stunned. And he says, Lord, but I'm a man with sin. I'm a man who isn't worthy of this. So the Lord in this vision says, all right, I will send a seraphim to you with a burning hot coal, and that coal will be placed in your mouth, and that will burn out, that will atone for your sin. And now you can go forward and serve me as I lead you. So Isaiah goes on to use his gifts his experience, his, his qualities, his talents, everything to serve the Lord. And you know what? I mean, he's called out of this great job. Prophets had a rough deal. Prophets were generally not liked by anybody for any length of time. Why is that? Because of what they had to do. They had to pronounce condemnation. They had to tell people what they were doing wrong. They had to tell people if they didn't straighten out their act, the Lord was going to do some stuff to make them pay attention and straighten up, and he had to have known this is going to be a hard, hard life. But he also had something beautiful the Lord let him do. Isaiah got from the Lord uh, this prophecy and a series of prophecies about a coming Messiah. And in a little bit, we'll share some of the verses that is shared in Isaiah that we, we really read most at Christmas time. Uh, so Isaiah confronted the people's sin, and we read about this in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so he will not hear. Well, that's a tough message to get. But he also told of God's plan to wash his people clean. In Isaiah 1, verses 18 and 19, he says, Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. 
Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are, here it is. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. And then Isaiah also encouraged and told of the Lord's goodness. And see if you can't find a verse in here that's familiar to you. It's one of the most commonly quoted verses from Isaiah. So I'm going to read you chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but here it is. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will, knock, they will walk and not be faint. And he told the people a way to reconcile with God once and for all would be provided. He started his prophetic ministry in 740 AD, long before the coming of the baby Jesus. So here's what he says in Isaiah 7, 14 about this. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which is in Hebrew means God with us. And further in Isaiah 9, verse 6, for to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. So Isaiah became a strong and courageous man of God, fearlessly proclaiming God's word. So that's a snapshot of Isaiah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the story of Nabil Qureshi. In 2011, Mother's Day, I was up here. Kevin was speaking at a conference out of town. He got a phone call from Mark Middleberg, who's been at Shoreline a number of times. He's a great teacher and a great author, great friend of Kevin's, and he called and said, Kevin, there's this guy who has a layover in the Bay Area, and you got to hear his story. I've come to know him. He's a terrific young man. He's amazing. Could he preach on Sunday? And Kevin said, no, he can't preach. We're all set up. But maybe we can have a way that we can interview him and talk to him a little bit. So we had two stools like this right here. They were on the stage. I sat on one, and this young man named Nabil Qureshi sat on the other. And I asked him a series of questions. What is, it, what is this story we're hearing about? What is this story? Let, let's put some shots up there and see if you recognize them. That's Nabil. So you might say, oh, that guy. Because he went on to speak at a number of organic outreach conferences and also preach on Sundays. So I'm asking him questions, and here's just a brief bit of what I learned from him that day. You know, what brings you here? He said, well, I was raised in a Muslim family, the Ahmadiyya sect of Islam. And so that would make Nabil an Ahmadi. And he had the best family imaginable. By all the standards where we assess a family, loving mom and dad, supportive mom and dad. Uh, his father was an officer in the U.S. Navy. And they were devoted Muslims. They went to their mosque. They gave to charity. They volunteered. They went to conferences. They had great friends. And Nabil had a spectacular mind they knew at an early age. By the age of five, he'd already mem remembered, or memorized, I should say, parts of the Quran, and by his early teens, he had memorized the majority of the Quran. And they knew they had something special, and he knew what he wanted to be was a Muslim apologist. That's what he wanted to be. And he ended up becoming, by the time he sat here, on a career track to be a Christian apologist. So you might be asking, what's an apologist? Let me read you the verse that would be the mission statement for apologists. We find it in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Peter says this, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. 
So apologists are uniquely trained and study hard and engage in the practice of defending the faith, meaning in debates, meaning at conferences, meaning at college campuses where people ask those hard questions and an apologist is ready to say, I'm glad you asked that. Here's how it is. Here's, here's what the Bible says. And they have to read not just scripture. They read volumes of other books about scripture and of historical accounts and all of that to become a good apologist. And Nabil was becoming one of the brightest young Muslim apologists. And now he was becoming one of the brightest young Christian apologists. By the way, we're going to start a, an apologi apologetics track in classes in fall here. So be on the lookout. We're going to let you know how that goes. We want to help our congregation if somebody wants to get trained in how to do good apologetics. So Nabil knew that God had called him to be an instrument of truth, and he would suffer like Paul. He shared that with us. And I think of how it's put in Acts chapter 9, verses 15 and 16. It says, but the Lord said to Ananias, who was caring for Paul right after he was struck on the road to Damascus, the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. And catch this, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Nabil's suffering began with his family. As he sat on that stool on Mother's Day, I said, so what's it been like for you? What's happened since you let your family know this incredible family devoted to Islam? What happened? He goes, I'm shunned. And he wept. He was broken, just broken. And at the same time, ecstatic that he'd found Jesus, he had this crazy mix inside of him. And he was just broken. I can't talk to them. What do you mean? No, I can't talk to them. They will not speak with me. He didn't just lose a family. A lot of people say, well, not being away from my family was fine. Not for Nabil. It was absolutely crushing. It says in Mark, we, we hear about how this works in Mark chapter 10. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in the present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, but along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last First, Nabil was committed to using his personal story, his gifts, and his calling for apologetics. So a lot like Paul and a lot like Isaiah, brilliant mind, great training, great skills, great gift and energy and resilience and passion for the kingdom and for the practice of apologetics. Nabil went on to write three books. This is the first book. Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. I've told people many times that if someone said to me, which three books can you read about Christianity, aside from the Bible, would you read? You could only read three. My three would be Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis, Case for Christ, Lee Strobel, and Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. This is absolutely a must read for every Christian. It absolutely is. And then he started a second book, No God But One, Allah or Jesus. And you could tell about his friendship with David Wood, who helped him come to the Lord when they were college roommates. It's a unique friendship. This book is dedicated to David Wood, a great friend and a real doofus. <laughs> but in between, Zondervan approached him and said, we know you got the second book in the works, but... What about ISIS? What about Islam? What about the Middle East? What about it? Can you do something? And he ended up writing this book quickly in between the two called Answering Jihad, A Better Way Forward. It's outstanding. He takes the 18 most commonly asked questions about jihad within Islam, Islam and he explains them. Beautiful stuff. These are still selling and people are all over the world are, are buying them. 
So Nabil, Nabil, like Isaiah, became a strong and courageous man of God, fearlessly proclaiming God's word. I want you to listen to how he viewed us here at Shoreline. Watch the screen. Um, I do love this church. I've been, uh, I've been coming here since 2011. Um, any chance I have to sneak to Monterey, I do. Uh, I think one day I just showed up randomly. No one expected me here. I drove down from San Francisco because I had a layover. And uh, I was just like, hey, I'm here. And they're like, whoa, Nabil. Uh, I just love coming here because, uh, you know, I have been privileged to be able to, uh, by the Lord's grace, go to various places around the world and to be able to share the gospel, to talk to people, to encourage churches, to train and equip. And there are a few places where you know God is moving. You can sense the Holy Spirit. Uh, if, you've, if you've stayed in his presence and you've sought him, you can recognize him when he's there. And someone gave me great advice once. Uh, they said, Nabil, if you want to have a powerful life for the sake of the kingdom, then find out where God is working and go there and invest. And this is one of those places. Nabil and Michelle fell in love with Shoreline and Monterey and built wonderful friendships here. It was unique. They came here and stayed at Dr. Rick Alexander's house and Veronica's more times than I can count. And so he became a strong and courageous man of God. What else did they have in common? Isaiah and Nabil. They both had a life that was known, that was comfortable, that was underway, that they were set. Nabil was going to be a physician. After his conversion to Christianity, he was set and God had other plans. And Isaiah and Nabil both suffered greatly. I shared with you about the price Nabil paid with his family. Over the years, I want to let you know, they have come back together. His, his widow, Michelle, is now close to his family. And they, Nabil's dad came back into his life again before he passed away. And Jesus said to both of them, they would suffer if they followed him. So we, through our friendships here, had built this wonderful tradition of going to the Sea of Cortez in Mexico. And I see a couple of people in here who've done that trip with us in the past. In 2013, Nabil said, I want to go, I want to go. So Dr. Rick Alexander and myself and Nabil and Rick's cousin Mike went fishing to this little village in the Sea of Cortez, Mexico. And when we were done, Nabil said, I won't ever miss this again. This is the best vacation I've ever had. It was so much fun. The next year he went again. Then we all missed 2015. Then in 2016, Nabil said, I want to go, guys, but here's when I can go. You see, what happened in the interim is somebody came to him and said, if you will study for a doctorate in New Testament, we will help you if you get into Oxford. And they had done that. Nabil got in one of the most demanding programs in the world on the New Testament. And there he was with his wife, Michelle. So he gave us the dates that he could go. So Pastor Kevin and Rick and I, and we book our flights, we book the place, we book everything. Two weeks before, he goes, guys, I can't go. I goes, what do you mean you can't go? They scheduled the exams that week here at Oxford. We said, well, they got to change them. He goes, they, they don't. You've got to change. And I said, we can't change. We're locked in. We don't know if we're going to have any other times we can go. you got to do it. He goes, they, they've never done it. And we said, well, then we're just going to have to pray. <laughs> and that's what we did. And we prayed, and we didn't know what was going to happen. He kept thinking, I can't go. Then he calls us a few days before, and he says, you won't believe it. Oxford changed the dates of my exam. First time in over 100 years they've done that for anybody. So, I'm coming, boys. And he lands at the airport, and we're already there, and he's on the phone. And I'm going, okay, you're on the phone. Get off the phone. Because we always go to this restaurant, and we have this hot Mexican food before we drive up the coast. And he won't get off the phone. He's just on the phone. Come on. I'm rolling my eyes. What's he doing? So, we finally get off, and we go to the Mexican restaurant, and, and he and I order this, this bowl of food that, it's not even food. It's just like heat in a bowl. And we just sweat, look at each other and turn red, and he couldn't eat. We're going, what's going on? He goes, I got a little something here. I had it tested before I came. I'm sure I'll be fine. But that week was very different. He was not the same, and he couldn't really eat much at all. 
But on the phone, we learned that he was on the phone with Ravi Zacharias, one of the great apologists of, this, of, this, of his time, who's now gone home to be with the Lord recently. He was on the phone with Ravi because he'd begun working for Ravi, and while he was at Oxford, he still traveled and taught for Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, doing apologetics. And they were talking about changes in how Nabil would be affiliated with RZIM. I didn't know that. But we ended up talking about it all week, the four of us. We had a good time anyway. Two weeks after we returned, he got the diagnosis that he had stage four stomach cancer. I got to tell you, it was a gut punch, certainly to him and Michelle, but to us as well. It was a gut punch. Jesus said they would suffer. Anyone who follows him will suffer. Nabil didn't suffer the cancer because he followed Jesus, but he lost everything for a number of years with his family, and now he was suffering again because he's in this world again, and this world's a rough place. And I, I think, when I think of his suffering, I, I think of the suffering of Jesus. You know, we, we can look at that physical suffering of Jesus, but the suffering really that when he said, if it be possible, take this cup from me, I believe he was referring to, I'm going to be briefly separate from my father. It's unthinkable for me, but your will be done, not mine. So I think he was in that upper room at the Last Supper, Jesus was, before everything was going to happen that night. And they had their meal, and they're all gathered there, and I could imagine him thinking, what am I going to, what? I know what we need to do together. I know what we need to do. We need to have a, a special way to remember this night and for them to rem remember it forever. And what happens here is Paul reads to them, or excuse me, in 1 Corinthians, the apostle Paul reads what Jesus said to them that night. We call it communion. And, and if you're at home watching this online and we're glad you're with us, you don't know what communion is, just watch. Watch what I do. You'll learn more about it. And someday it may be exactly right for you. That's what we hope. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And I would encourage you right now before I lead us in this, if there's any hardness in your heart, anything that needs healing in you with someone else just personally, we'll have a moment of quiet before I lead us. And I'd encourage you to just give that to him. Just give it to the Lord. Let's have a moment of quiet. Just consider your own heart. Join me in taking the elements. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We are connected with those original disciples in the upper room in our remembering of him and the taking of the elements. Just, just enjoy that. It's been happening ever since and it will continue.
So Isaiah closes his book with powerful words from the Lord. Isaiah 66, verses 22, 23. It says, as the new heavens and the new earth that I make endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. Here's what Nabil said on his video log the night he got his diagnosis, a very grim diagnosis. He said, this is an announcement that I never expected to make. But God in his infinite and sovereign wisdom has chosen me for this refining. And he always saw it as refining. He always saw the Lord's hand. Watch the video logs and you'll see the journey. And I pray he will be glorified through my body and my spirit. The last words on his very last video log when he knew it was over. He said this. As you consider my ministry, I hope it leaves a message of love, of peace, of truth, of caring for one another. Our God is a God of love. He passed away in 2017. Ravi Zacharias spoke at the memorial and Pastor Kevin and Sherry went. And when Pastor Kevin went up to shake Ravi's hand, he said, where are you from? I'm Pastor Kevin Arney from Shoreline, Monterey. He goes, Nabil was talking about going there to join on your staff. I didn't know this. Nabil and Michelle had planned to come here and Nabil would share the teaching on the shoreline staff. So much he's a part of us. So I have some questions for us tonight. How about us? What are our gifts? Do you know what your gifts are? You know if you follow Jesus, you have gifts. It's impossible to be without gifts because he, he gives them to you when you turn your heart over to him, I want to ask you tonight, what is God saying to you? What's he saying? I've been asking myself for weeks, what's he saying to me about this? What's he saying? Are there other plans? What are God's other plans for you and me? You see, they were snatched out of a very calm and comfortable, easy, great life. And the, Isaiah and Nabil, even the Apostle Paul and God said, no, I got other plans. Are we available for those other plans? Pastor Craig Groeschel of Life Church says this, if you're not dead, you're not done. You know, you never leave ministry. You might leave a ministry staff as a paid position, but if you're a believer of Jesus, you never leave ministry. You do ministry like Nabil did up till his very last breath, which I'm sure Isaiah did which I know that Paul did. That's us. Would you please pray? Pray and he'll let you know. Pray. And read his word. And listen. Listen. Just listen. Because if you're here, there's a reason. There's a plan for your life like mine. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that not a one of us who follows you ever has to worry about what's our purpose, what's the meaning of our life. You tell us in your holy book, we're not confused. We may not know the exact direction, but we're not confused that we have a commissioning and we have commands to follow, which is to love and to follow you. Speak to each one of us individually tonight, Lord, because each one of us is Imago Day made in your image for a purpose in this world to serve you, bring glory to you, and take the light and love of Jesus to others, serving in the church, speaking to others, looking for opportunities to share our faith. Move us forward, Father, especially in these very difficult and troubled times, as did Isaiah and as did Nabil. And we thank you for them, Father. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.